going to introduce the next speaker who clearly needs no introduction because he's having like this fan uh, <laughs> club <laughs> happening since yesterday, um, as, as per usual. Uh, but I still want to give him a warm uh, welcome, of course, because I would call him a dear friend um, whom I got to know not only as a philosopher, um, uh, but a post-humanist animist who's seeking equity, justice, and hope, and above all of that, a loving father. Uh, I'm talking about no other than, of course, Dr. Bayo Akomolafe. He's an author, celebrated speaker, speaker uh, teacher, and the founder of the Emergence Network, and someone who always finds the most poetic words, uh, even in the darkest moments. So please give your warmest embrace to Bayo Akomolafe. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Hasn't this been wonderful and beautiful? How many of you think this has been a wonderful, beautiful convergence of possibilities? Um, it has. And I just want to take a little bit of some time to honor those who made it possible. And because I come from Africa, we never do things alone, and we believe in African time, which doesn't adhere to clock time, which is excessive and generous. So I'm just gonna ask everyone to rise up on your feet and give a round of applause, not just for the organizers, but for this moment in time, when we as a people, thank you to OBI, to the, Forum, Democracy and Belonging Forum, for making this happen. And thank you to yourselves. Put your hands together for yourselves. Thank you. All right, that's it. Sit down now. It's okay. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Bayo Akomalafe, and... I felt I would start by saying something that is probably controversial. It's the best way to start, right? <laughs> so we're in a time of crisis, upheavals, wars, very human conflagratory moments. And in those or in these moments, I like to say or start by making a statement, and this is the statement. I am not a humanist. I am not a humanist. I'm not a very good one, maybe. It takes some practice to be a humanist. Now, for, for those of you who may not understand what I'm speaking about, what I'm talking about, by saying I'm not a humanist, I'm not saying I hate humans, right? That's not the point. Even though my daughter, who's 10 years old now, declared to me recently that she hates humans. <laughs> that she wished she could just eradicate humankind so that animals could thrive, right? We had a long conversation. I don't need to tell you about that. Um, I'm not saying that I'm amphibian or that I'm the herald for a reptilian regime that is about it. I'm not saying any of that. For those of you who may have heard me speak before, when I say I'm not a humanist, I'm saying I find it incre incredibly and excessively difficult to speak about the world as if it boils down to human selves and human individuals. It's very difficult for me. I think in terms of connections and relationships, that the world isn't made up of things, it is made up of relations, right? That we're not stable selves and stable identities interacting with other stable selves and stable identities. We're in fact meandering lines, seeking, becoming, co-becoming with others. And these others are not just human others. They are more than human others. Right now, you're seated in your chairs. 
you're not just seated in your chairs. You're now a hybrid of chair and person, thinking with the world and becoming with the world. You're cyborgian. You're, you're algorithmic. You're ecological. You're not isolated as you think, which is a capitalist myth, right? And I'm a psychologist. I can tell you more about that, right? So you're more than that. We are more than that. We're more than what meets the eye. So I'm deeply interested in the partial, in the incomplete, in the amniotic, in the emergent, in the open-ended, in the processual, in the relational, in the yet to come. I'm interested in things as they emerge, right? And this is the reason why I want to say what next I want to say. And that is, I find it a little bit inadequate to describe love as a bridge. And that is because bridges connect two points, right? Two independent points. It's possible to get to a bridge and turn away. I'm looking for more ecstatic, rhizomatic, intimate, probably orgasmic definitions of love that I cannot escape from. So I often describe love as a hyphen, because you know what a hyphen does? It pierces through the skin, through the flesh, through the bones. I cannot turn away from a hyphen. A hyphen means I am co-dependent on you, with you, and we are co-becoming together, okay? It means I am you. Right? We have a philosophy for that where I come from. You might have heard it. It's a software, Ubuntu. <laughs> okay? That we are together in this in ways that are too ecstatic for language to capture and articulate. So one more ritual. This is a sacred ritual. So take it with great seriousness. This ritual that we're about to enter into, it's ancient. It comes from a land called Wakanda. And I'm going to ask us to perform this ritual right now, okay? That is, find someone around you and hug them so tight that you stain their skin with the color of yours. Okay, can we do this together? Everyone rise. You have no choice. I have the mic. Make it tight, make it tight, make it tight. <laughs> All right, that's enough. That'll do. I have a plane to catch. That'll do. That's enough. Give the people an inch. How did that feel? Love is a hyphen, not just a bridge. It's a hyphen. I'm a storyteller. I'm going to start with a story as I enter into contemplations, reflections about politics today and what politics is doing and the kinds of solidarities that are opening up to us as a people, as a species. In 1803, 75 men, women, and children were taken from, I think, the Bight of Benin, West Coast, Africa. And these men, women, and children were taken aboard a ship that sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and arrived at a state in the United States you might have heard of called... I wish philosophy were like music. 
where you could just sing the lyrics. I'll just be like, <laughs> Deleuze is Georgia. State of Georgia, state of Georgia, state of Georgia. All right, let's not do Georgia in my mind, okay? <laughs> All right, so Georgia arrived, the state of Georgia, and were sold. These bodies were sold to the highest bidders and taken aboard another ship that went deeper into the state. They arrived summarily at Dunbar Creek, where those men, women, and children mounted up an insurgency against their captors and seized the ship. They threatened the men that enslaved them, and some of them escaped inland to get reinforcements. Reinforcements come around and recaptured their properties. At this time, they had a choice. Do we walk into the plantation and give our bodies to the labor of this plantation? What other option is possible? And so what they did was to line up. You might have heard the story. How many of you have heard this story before? Oh, wow. So they lined up single file, 1803. Igbo, they're from the Igbo people in present-day Nigeria, East Nigeria. Um, and so they lined up and they marched into the waters, singing an ancestral song. And the song was Amadioha, that's the name of the God. Amadioha, who brought us here, would take us back home. And they marched right in. Right in. Now, there are two stories that have emerged from that incident that, that is popularly called the Igbo Landing. One is the account of a man called Roswell, who was one of the plantation managers. He wrote in his diary the official account of what happened, and he ended with a sentence as clinical and as direct and as precise as white modernity. They drowned. That's it. That's all we have. That's all there is to know about it. But there was another account, rumors of what was happening, spilling through plantations, whispered, you know, from mother to child, and it took root and flight. And that story was that, no, they transformed into blackbirds and they flew home to Africa. Which one do you trust? The second one? Why? We should always believe the facts. Only the facts. So why would you trust the second one? It seems made up, right? Well, so, uh, Sadia Hartman says, facts are the nation's preferred, the nation state's preferred fiction, right? Um, there is a sense here that is often left out. When we prioritize clarity as the only way to be in the world, clarity is a political commitment. It's not just seeing the world as it is. I don't want us to get into the history of the scientific method, but the idea here is that the world proliferates itself in more ways than can be fitted or seen beneath the gaze of the microscope, that there are other ways of being alive in the world. But I want to leave this story with a question. Did they get home? Did they get home? That's the question I want to leave with you. Did they get home? Okay. And my sense of things is it depends on who you're asking. One way to think about this is since they went into the water, you know, the wonderful speculative fabulation of turning into birds is beautiful, but they went into the water. And there's something about water that resists distance. 
In water, there is no distance. In water, there is no indifference. In water, there are no stable origins and destinations. It's not like fish doesn't, don't get from here to there. I'm trying to say in water, those stable ideas are queered such that to set out is to arrive, right, in a sense. The world is so fluid in watery depths that one cannot simply move from here to there, okay? And it is that geometry of distance, that idea of getting home, that seems to be at stake in the world today. And I put it to you that home, the concept of belonging, is the shimmering, struggling, wrestling concept at the heart of the Middle uh, East crisis, at the heart of our crisis as people gestating in white modernity. We are struggling with the ways belonging has been framed. Belonging seems to be in crisis. Belonging is in crisis because belonging has been framed as a matter of nation state citizenship, rectilinearity, neurotypicality, showing up, frontal presence, in the ways that we understand what it means to be a proper self. That is how belonging is framed. That is why someone like my son, who is six years old and, and, and on the autistic spectrum, is, doesn't belong in the, in the realms of properness. That is why for a long time, black bodies like mine found it difficult, still find it difficult to be accepted in the spectrum of what it means to be a proper human being. Because to be human is to show up in the world in a particular way. Belonging is in crisis. Let me take you through a little bit of the politics that has framed belonging in the ways that we understand it today. So, breathe, okay? Remember to breathe. Because I don't do small talk. <laughs> or inspirational talk, you know. Um, just take several steps back to 1945. Hiroshima, August 6th, and Nagasaki, August 9th. The tail end of the Second World War, explosions. The human becomes radioactive, and then the world recoils in the trauma of those explosions and says, never again. We will never allow this to happen again. And how does this traumatic event become resolved? Through a traumatic response, right? The US leads an intervention to flatten the entire world under a liberal world order. Liberalism is an enlightenment. Our big brother and elder, John, was speaking about this yesterday. Liberalism is an enlightenment philosophy, a political ideology that is based on the idea that Sarah and I are separate, right? That we are isolated, that you are you and I am myself. And you have your private thoughts and I have my private thoughts and you have your free will and I have my free will and never the twain shall meet, right? Because we're isolated, separate, inseparable. Immune, impervious, masters of the realm, right? We have everything figured out. All we need to do is gather in conferences like this. Snap our fingers, maybe once or twice, click our heels, I can't do that, I'm wearing sneakers, and then stuff happens. But we're learning in small doses that the world exceeds this liberal structure this liberalist structure, this idea of containment, right? But it is this very idea, this ideology that has framed the ways we understand justice, it frames the way we understand protest and activism, it has framed our ideas of what the good life is, right? People walk into a place like mine and say, let's flatten this mountain and make space for a parking lot, that's my colonial voice. <laughs> I'm not good at impressions, but let's flatten and make room for a parking lot. Let's
Let's progress together. Development, clock time, all these things emerged from the radioactivity of that bomb blast that was a traumatic upheaval of some kind. And so we are in dire straits because liberalism is war. It's war against the other. It's war against ecology. We don't quite see it because we're normalized within it, right? We've learned somehow to accept that we are part of this. This is the way the world is. How many of you were born after 1945? <laughs> okay. All right, Sarah, no? <laughs> Do you know that when, those, when, when the explosion went off, little bits of radioactivity escaped into the sky, into the clouds, into the waters, into plants and animals and our food systems and that we ingested this radioactivity so that babies born still in the 2000s, maybe 2010, as at the last time I read reports about it, scientific reports about it, were born with little bits of radioactivity in their cells from 1945. The war didn't end, ladies and gentlemen. We are still ringing with explosions. It's just that we've gotten very good at hiding it. We're still in war. We're still and have always been at war. Liberalism is the idea of war. Rectilinearity is the idea of war. We are at war with ourselves, with the others. And this is the realm of dissociation that is in, informing the ways we're responding to the crisis. And that is why a first tenet of my philosophy of post-activism is that the way we respond to the crisis is often the crisis. The way we respond to the crisis is the crisis gaining intelligence. When October 7 happened, Operation Iron Swords, I think it's called, um, I cast my gaze across the social media landscape and noticed the way people were responding to it. I might ask you if I had time, but um, I'll skip that. I'll tell you, people were saying, I stand with, let's get involved, let everyone get involved. And it's courageous to get involved, it's nice, it's morally just, except that it's also problematic. And I'll tell you why. Who here likes donuts? It's a beautiful segue from Hiroshima to donuts, but that's the kind of stuff that I... Who likes donuts? You like donuts? Krispy Kreme, stuff like that? Okay. When last did you have a donut? Just anyone? Last time you had a donut? For $10,000, your answer. A week ago. Sarah, Sarah will give you that. The money from there. A week ago, when you had that donut, you probably felt this is a juicy, yummy donut and, and there's nothing else to it. Or you probably didn't think about it at all in that way. But eating a donut as ordinary and mundane and violently unremarkable as that might seem is connected with the decimation of Sumatran tigers. Every time you take a bite, you are reinforcing invisible networks of suffering that trace their way from the bite, as innocuous as it seems, to the big oil industries. I'm not talking about crude oil. I'm talking about frying oil, right? Those companies that fry, that provide the oil with which the donut companies fry their stuff, right? And the oil comes from deforestation. And deforestation means the loss of orangutans and tigers. If I told you to get involved as you are eating a donut, what does that violently elide or erase? It 
erases the ways you are already complicit, that we are already involved. It, there's no getting involved. We are already, liberalism teaches us that we're outside of it, we're standing apart, now get involved. Right? No, we're not getting involved. We are already part of entangling worlds, networks of suffering. How many of you use your phones? Do you have phones? Anyone has phones here? No? Someone is saying, no, I know where you're going with this crap, so I'm not going <laughs> to. That guy, you. It's like, no, never heard of it. Phones are connected to the suffering of Congolese children who mine cobalt, which is needed for your smartphones to run their batteries. Every time you pick up your phone and you use your phone, you're igniting those circuitries of suffering. There's no purity to escape into. It's just the way of things that the world is uneven, and you will step on toes and loss, and you will ignite suffering in some way. If you seek to escape, then you might be inventing colonial fascist arrangements, because every attempt at purity is an attempt to escape the troubling, what Donna Haraway would invite us to notice when she says, stay with the trouble. Every attempt to escape entanglement is an attempt to to master the world, to control it. So we are already involved. There's no escape in that. A brother in Hopland, California, thank you, my sister, um, said to me once that bio, you know what? I'm gonna invite people to leave Facebook behind. And I was like, wow, wonderful, tell me about it. And it's like, we're just gonna do permaculture I'm gonna inspire and network a movement of people doing permaculture and we're gonna leave this, what's his name again? The founder of Facebook? Zuckerberg. We're gonna leave this Zuckerbergian universe behind and do stuff with our hands. And I was like, tell me how you're gonna do it. I said, just, I've already started this Facebook group and, <laughs> phew, you know, he, right. I think it speaks for itself. So I'm trying to trouble the idea of the ways that we form solidarity. I'm trying to trouble it. I work with trickster spirits and trickster, archety trickster archetypes to trouble positionality, to trouble perspectivality, to trouble the ways that we show up especially when showing up and speaking truth to power. This is why Fred Moulton would say, one does not speak truth to power. <gasps> why? What else do we do then? Because speaking truth to power is often a reinforcement of particular forms of speaking that nourishes a regime of truth or a regime of power, right? There's a sense in which protest can often become part of the department or part of the organelles of the very paradigms we're trying to upend. Watch enough sci-fi movies to notice that the, the heroes often become the, vi the villain's pawns at the end, right? They're tools for continuity. So when I started to see how people were getting involved Again, which is not a bad thing. I don't see the world in terms of bad or good, right? But when I started to see the way people were tracing or establishing solidarity, and they were, this, they were doing it in one of two ways. It was a binary. One was, I either stand with Israel or I stand with Palestine. And then the second way was, it's both and. None of them were good options for me. Now, let me tell you something. I'm African, and it is impossible for me, and I'm just being vulnerable here, it is impossible for me to articulate compassion and sympathy for anything that sounds like an occupation of others. I come from a history of people who were controlled 
and cordoned off and put in concrete jails. I know what it feels like in my bones intergenerationally. The stories reached me. The trauma persists. So I know what it is to be part, to be locked up in that way, to be called an animal, to say, hey, he has big lips, he's probably an animal, to have to defend your intelligence by presenting your two PhDs every time you move through an airport. I know what it is to wander through the world that way. So it's painful. But if I were to stop there and say there's an apartheid occupational presence here, if I were to stop there and ontologize evil and say that the others are evil, then I would be participating in whiteness. And you know what whiteness is? Whiteness is not white people. Whiteness is the imperviousness to entanglement. Whiteness is the fascist refusal to participate in a world that is ongoing and flowing like water. Whiteness is settlement building, saying this is where we mark the ground. This is what identity looks like. This is what power looks like. That's whiteness. It also entrapped white bodies, just as it entrapped black bodies. Because to sit atop a pyramid is to be impoverished. Right? So I'm not saying white people here. I like to point that out many times because many people mistake whiteness for white people. James Baldwin said it, if you think you're white, you, you have no hope, right? So that's not the point here. The point here is if I were to stop, if I were to say that this binary is all there is, then I would be at a great loss. Then I would be trapped in this bubble, in this liberalist, in liberalist bubble. There has to be other ways for us to build solidarities. Now, this is not saying standing with, I got that, standing with is, the, is bad. But we need to find other ways of co-creating because again, the issue here is not the other side. In a game of sides, we always lose the other side. The issue here is not victory. The issue here is not winning the competition because the, the premises of peace have never been founded on who was correct or who is correct. And to be correct in an entangled universe is to be separate from it. We have to start thinking beyond the liberalist bubble that we're in, that we are isolated people acting in isolation, having independent thoughts. We have to notice the way we are all enlisted, sometimes in the architecture that keeps this war afoot. We need a different kind of politics, is what I'm trying to say. A third way, an Israeli spokesman uh, not a spokesman any longer, but he was a spokesman, and he got up on TV recently, I forget his name, he said, the failure of politics to provide a third way is the issue here, a third way. What is a third way? Not a milk a toast Socratic middle. That's not what I'm talking about. The third way is that which breaks the binary. Because what we're seeking here is the sweltering, generous materiality of care that embraces everyone, that invites us to melt in the hospitality of our siblings. We don't have that now. As a psychologist, I know painfully that there aren't places to grieve, that even healing and therapy is tied to patriarchal ideas of productivity that I want you to get you back on the rat wheel. So I shrink you and I tell you, hey, get back out there. And our diagnostic tools like the APA tells you, you can only grieve for one year. After one year, it's pathological. What if we held space for the fugitive, for the fugitivity of grief? What if that broke open new ways of sensing? What if politics is grieving together? What if loss is blackness? Blackness, not blackness as an identity, the other, the identitarian blackness. No, blackness, 
blackness as a decolonial force that upends settlement, that tugs on the sleeves of monoliths, that invites us to adopt new postures. That's what grieving does. It breaks rectilinearity and it invites us to fall to our knees. What if grieving is a form of post-activism? What if there's space in this loss? Shimmering gaps and spaces and portals in the dark clouds that are flowing into our cities, inviting us to mourn together, to lament together. These are the strange solidarities I speak of, the invitations to fall to the earth. You might think, that doesn't do anything, Bio. We need to get out there. We need to do stuff. Yes, we do. But we also need to address the fact that sometimes we repeat the patterns that has kept this war afoot for generations. We repeat the same patterns. We've been doing the same thing over and over again. Why hasn't anything changed? Right now, McDonald's is giving free burgers to soldiers in, in Israel. Because war is profitable. The same patterns repeat themselves, right? We say, oh, we're going to get involved. McDonald's is like, yeah, let's get involved. We condemn this. We stand with this. Send burgers. Put out your name there. And the same thing happens over again. We need to break that binary. It's not left to you and I, though. That's liberalism, again, that is left to us to save the day. I don't believe that. I think the world is also acting. I think ancestors are also acting. I think whales are also acting. I think furniture is also acting. To think that it's on our shoulders and it's left to us to pull the string to save the day is to be alone. And we're not alone. We're not alone. So this is not a we can do it moment. No, that's not. This is not that. This is, uh, we need new kinds of eyes. We need new kinds of strains. We need new kinds of getting lost. My Yoruba people would say, in order to find your way, you must become lost. That's the kind of cartography we need, the choreography of becoming one with the world, of listening anew to the world. Somehow, I believe that water isn't just the only fluid space, that we are already connected with the wars around the world. Not just Eritrea and Ethiopia, not just Ukraine and Russia, not just um, Israel and Palestine. It's we are connected with these moments, just like your donuts is connected to tigers. We are connected in ways we don't even know how to articulate. But yet, this is the time to do something like what my dear sister, Professor Erin Manning, will call the minor gesture. The minor gesture. The minor gesture. Small revolutions that may not make it on CNN. Learning to think again together with plants. Learning to think with the world. Learning to see each other anew. Finding new ways of creating hospitality for people around us. Making room for our monsters. Refusing to rehabilitate monsters. And taking them to picnics and sitting with them and having a conversation with those things that the DSM has pathologized as sickness. I know the politics of pathology. And I'm saying it's time to open our doors or else we're stuck. OK, I have a plane to catch. Thank you. All right, it's enough. Um, I, I, do I do have a plane to catch, but I just want to say thank you. We have this together, and we can do stuff together. God willing, microbes willing, chairs willing, the world willing, we can do and break new dimensions of being together. God bless you.